This is Dr. Werner von Braun. His achievements in rocket design are unequalled. Von Braun led a team of engineers to develop the German terror weapon, the V-2. This was the world's first ballistic missile and progenitor to all modern rockets. During the Second World War, over 3,000 V-2s were launched. Many never made it to their target. Its reign of terror was completely random and impossible to stop. Von Braun was on the top of the American blacklist of German scientists to be captured. In 1945, he surrendered to American troops. They were well aware of his importance. The V-2 blueprints were hidden in an abandoned mine shaft in the Hartz Mountains, as Von Braun feared the SS would destroy all his work. Under Operation Overcast, Von Braun was sent to America, where his work continued, culminating in the moon rocket, the Saturn V. The Saturn launch vehicles were especially designed to lift heavy payloads into orbit, adopted by the Apollo program as the vehicle to go to the moon. Von Braun insisted on using the largest rocket motors ever built to power the first stage. Known as F1 motors, they burned two tonnes of liquid oxygen and one tonne of kerosene every second. The F1 went through years of development before it was deemed reliable enough to be considered for manned flight. The thrust of just one F1 is greater than all three of the Space Shuttle main engines. Here is Peenemunde in northwestern Germany where the V-2 was developed and launched. Here we see the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, USA, home of the Saturn V and Space Shuttle. Here we see Kringo High School and North Tamara Tip, home to the Backyard Rocket Project. Here is my tethered rocket test area in the backyard. These were mainly Estes reloads. Most were unsuccessful. In 1986, Estes rocket motors were the only choice for backyard rocket scientists. The largest choice available in Australia is D-size. The rockets were made of cardboard tube and balsa wood. Nose cones were usually rolled cardboard. Recovery systems were never built into these rockets. It was always a case of look up and live. The damage was usually pretty minor as these rockets were very light in weight. It was always intricate work setting up the fragile igniters inside the tiny rocket motors. Sometimes a small smoke generator was added to aid in tracking the rocket's flight. I even fired rockets from my car. I had a four shot firing system incorporated into the dashboard. Rockets can be strapped to anything. A small toy car is a perfect vehicle to advance the knowledge base. It was a bundle of various homemade rockets and a reminder that rockets can be totally unpredictable. A later night test proved successful. In 1990, I worked for a fireworks company. This gave me access to large, powerful rocket motors. My school friend Carl designed some new rockets, but these motors had reliability issues. It blew the whole back out. Look. I can't see what's happening. Blew the clay out. Yeah. Well, it was a success really, wasn't it? Not really, it blew the clay out. <laughs> we found a rocket club in Sydney. They had hopes one day of launching this space shuttle model. This club was located near Eastern Creek. The rocket club had some rules which we adhered to, except one, the size of the motor. Carl and I made some large rockets from postage tubing, and this time recovery systems were incorporated. The firework rockets were blowing out their clay choke. The rocket club only flew tiny toy rockets restricted to D-size as their largest motor. It was not looking good. Nearly all the firework rockets were malfunctioning, destroying the rockets built for the day. Had a problem. Watch 
on our final rocket, we were able to demonstrate a successful launch. It was a spectacular flight. The rocket flew well out of sight. We were able to reload and repeat our success. <laughs> Much to the approval of the Rocket Club, our recovery system worked, and for one day we were heroes. Six years would pass before our next advances in backyard rocketry. Here we are today at Carl's house, making a rocket. Carl is making the K1. Constructed with plastic plumbing, powered by distress flare motors, it would outperform any rocket we'd ever made. North Tamara Tip was deemed remote enough to trial a new rocket. The K1 was quite heavy in weight. The distress flare motor had no trouble launching the rocket. Its performance was astonishing to witness. And camera's rolling. Fire. <laughs> what a launch. Oh, a spec a spectacular launch there. We'll trample. Look, we'll trample down to that lower level. Yeah, and have a look. We covered the vehicle. A little the worse for wear. The K1 was recovered and repaired. Carl had plans for a more ambitious rocket, the K2. There are little engines. Quite big engines. The K2 had two stages. The staging would simply blow out the used motor and ignite the next. Larger fins and a multi-parachute recovery system and again made with plumbing parts. As you can see the precision workshop here of the K2. <laughs> it is much easier working with PVC plumbing hardware when making backyard rockets. It made the staging method easy to design. Here we see the rebuilt and now shorter K1 and the K2. A static test was done to cite the staging burn through on the first stage. K1 was the first to launch. Fire. Its recovery system failed and it had drifted close to surrounding houses. Yes, here we are off to recover the K1 second launch. The K2 was next to launch. Carl carefully prepared the motors and adjusted the flight angle away from surrounding property. You ready? You ready? They're standing by. Stand by. Fire. The second stage ignited late. The rocket ventured way off course across the valley into another suburb. Well, the K2 is somewhere down there. What a historic flight. The K2 was lost forever. The K1 was given a field repair and prepared for flight. The wind had picked up and again the rocket was blown towards surrounding houses. On impact, the K1 sustained substantial damage. It was 1996, and 10 years of great advances in the development of backyard rocketry came to a close. The K2 is still down in the North Taramara Valley, waiting to be found and rebuilt by the next generation of backyard rocket scientists. In 1988, I flew to America, visiting the Kennedy Space Center, Florida. It's one of the best tourist attractions I've visited in America. Considering it's an active spaceport, just days out from a launch, it's amazing they had tourists crawling all over the place. I noticed via Google Maps, the tourist center and rocket garden are vastly different today. Doing the bus tour of the facility exposes you to so much history related to the American space program. Just about every rocket built is represented. 
All are impressive monuments of past glory. In 1988, the spare Saturn V was laying next to the vehicle assembly building. It's difficult to express in words the size of this flying machine. It's also very difficult to photograph, as you never capture the whole craft in one photo. The Saturn V also launched Skylab into orbit, and only three examples remain today. Only one is recognised as an historic landmark, as it was used in actual engine test firings. The other two are assembled with surplus and dummy parts. Locals who witnessed the Saturn V launches all remark on the vibration and sound of the launch. That they said nothing else has come close to the show of raw power of those launches. Seeing the Saturn V really brings home the achievements of the Apollo program and the achievements of Von Braun's vision for a moon rocket. My visit coincided with the return to flight of the space shuttle after the Challenger disaster. This was Discovery and the 26th shuttle launch. The shuttle program needed to prove itself as a safe and reliable form of spaceflight. Seeing the pride in the American people was impressive. That's something they do very well. All the world was focused on this launch, as another mission loss would close the shuttle program. Seeing a shuttle launch is a very impressive event. They got her made. As long as that thing that they were sitting on there with all that fuel, that some fuel goes through there. Say, yeah. Them fuel lines are about that big around. Yeah, it's so it's so brilliant the flame, isn't it? Yeah. And that rumble, God. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, if the wind would have been blowing at us, we would have heard it rumble more. Yeah. But it was blowing towards Coco more, so. Yeah. Body today, you get the whole thing. Altitude 20 nautical miles, downrange distance 19 nautical miles.